And so today you're saying, Randy, why are you messing with the pulpit? Why are you pulling up this thing? Bruce really can't stand. No, it was Andrew. Andrew really can't stand it when I sit on the, uh, the uh, stool here. But to me, this seems like more of a conversation today than a sermon. And so I'm going to resist the urge to, st- to walk around and stomp. And I just want to talk to you really as somebody who just wants to be a blessing to you. And, and, and I want to start off with something that I don't like admitting, but it's a painful reality in my life. And the painful reality is this. If left alone, my life falls apart. If left alone, my life falls apart. You look back over the 48 years of my existence and the times that the, the evil one or my sin nature has been successful in separating me from people, isolating me from people, those are the time that my life falls apart. If you're ever wondering, we were just talking about how God speaks to us. If you ever wonder if the devil speaks to you, if the evil one speaks to you, any thought in your head that says don't hang out with people, isolate yourself from people, be a hermit, that is the evil one. Because when we are left alone, when we are isolated, our life falls apart. You're saying, Randy, why is that? Why? Why does our life fall apart when we're left alone? Why? Because whether we want to admit it or not, we are surrounded by enemies. Do me a favor. Say this out loud. I have an enemy. enemy. Say it again. "I I have an enemy. You see, whether you want to admit it or not, you have enemies in your life. Now, they may be inward enemies, enemies in your head, enemies in your heart, or they may be external enemies outside of your body, people around you. In fact, I'm going to give you something. If you're taking notes today, write this down. I want to give you some areas where you have enemies, whether you want to admit it or not. And it probably won't be on the the screen, so you just have to listen, okay? The first area that you have an enemy is that you have spiritual enemies. You have spiritual enemies. What is the spiritual enemy? That is someone or something that attacks your relationship with God, his word, or his people. Ooh, I wish I would have wrote that down. A spiritual enemy is someone or something in your life that attacks your relationship with God, his word, or his people. And you have spiritual enemies whether you want to admit it or not. When Megan goes to school this week, well, she may be out of school for Easter, but when Megan goes to school, there are in, spiritual enemies all around her that are trying to attack and divide and, and destroy her spiritual life. The second set, uh, type of enemies you have is what I call relational enemies. We have spiritual enemies, of course, but we also have relational enemies. We have enemies of our relationships. You have people out there that are trying to destroy your family relationships. You have people out there that are trying to destroy your friendships. It could be from within. It could be from without. But you have inner and outer relational enemies. The third type of enemy that you have is what I call physical enemies. You have physical enemies. Those are the the people or things in your life that try to destroy the body that God gave you. The temple of the Holy Spirit if you are a Christian. And there are people out there, there are things out there that their sole purpose in life is to destroy you physically. I would be willing to wager that most of the commercials that you see in life for food are done by enemies of you. Because you'll be sitting there, be bopping through life, you'll be doing great, having a good day, you have honored God with your eating, you have honored God with your drinking, then around 10 o'clock p.m., along comes a pizza commercial. Yeah, daggum. And you know you don't need a pizza, you're not hungry, but not only do you get a pizza, you get a deep dish pan pizza with a, st- a stuffed crust. And a soda. And then you wonder why you can't sleep at night. Why? A physical enemy of your soul. I believe, for example, when raising five kids now, going on six, that there are enemies all around my children trying to destroy their body at an early age. Tempting them to do things that they shouldn't do to their body and with their bodies. So we have physical enemies. Next we have financial enemies. Write that down. We have financial enemies. You live in the richest country, community in the world, 
in the history of mankind, and yet, guess what? Most of you do not have money. Why? Because you have financial enemies, those who are trying to steal from your finances. That is why we know this as a church, we know this as leaders, and that's why every week we have to talk about finances around here. Why? Because the devil and his forces are trying to steal from you. Why? Because if you are poor, you cannot help the poor. If you are poor, you cannot bless others. If you are poor, your ability to bless God's kingdom is limited. And so you have financial enemies, you have people and things, their goal and their job, again, it could be outside, it could be in your heart, but you have financial enemies whose job is to separate you from your money. But you also, finally, you have enemies of your reputation. You have reputation enemies. And this is what I mean. These are people, now I'm not talking about the stupid things that you've done, okay, If you've got an honest reputation, if your reputation in the community is based upon your behavior over the last decade, then guess what? That's not a reputation enemy. You've done that. I guess, well, you're the enemy, I guess. But I'm talking about those who are out there that are criticizing you, lying about you, saying things about you that are not true. They are trying to destroy your reputation. Why? Because anybody that walks with the Lord, God wants to use them to influence others. And the only way the evil one and his forces can keep us from influencing others is to destroy our reputation. I have been amazed at how in the last decade, people have walked up to me who have actually gotten to know me, have had a conversation with me, and have said things like, well, you're nothing like what I heard. Number one, why is anybody talking about me? Who am I? What have I done that deserves people's mouth to be on my reputation? But the evil one loves to go out and steal and kill and destroy our reputation. And he will use our family. He will use our friends. I am amazed. Write this down. Nobody really knows you but God. Nobody. I am amazed at some of the things that my wife has said about me. I am amazed at some of the things that my children have said about me. People who should know me best. And I looked them in the eye, I'm like, where did you get that? Oh, okay. So, if we're left alone... Our life will fall apart. Why? Because we are constantly surrounded by enemies from within our homes, from without of our homes. We are constantly surrounded by enemies. And again, you might want to write this down if you have ri- haven't written it on your sheet. We are often our own worst enemies. And if we're left to ourselves, the enemies of our souls will cause our life to fall apart. David talks about them in Psalm 57, 6. He says, my enemies could be talking about himself. Remember, nobody made him sleep with Bathsheba. Nobody made him kill Uriah. He said, my enemies have set a trap for me. They have dug a deep pit in my path. That's what enemies do. They try to set us up for destruction. They try to set us up to fail. Some of you right now are in a workplace surrounded by enemies. Andrew talks about that all the time. You are in a workplace surrounded by enemies. And you need to understand that they are not your friend, that they are digging pit, uh, uh, pits and they are setting traps for you. And when we isolate ourselves, we become that tragic figure found in Ecclesiastes 4.10 says how's this, how tragic it is for the one who is all alone when he falls. How tragic it is that when we fall in those pits, we fall into those traps set by our enemies, whether the enemy be us, whether the enemy be others. How tragic it is when we fall into those traps that other people have set for us, that we have set for ourselves. And so this week, after being reminded again of this constantly, I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, is there, is there some type of life insurance that I can get? Is there, is there something that I can do to keep me from falling into the pits of life, to keep me from falling into the traps that my enemies have set for me? 
And he showed me in our passage today, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning with verse 9, what I call the triple A life insurance policy. You want a life, you want something to ensure that you don't fall into those pits. You want, a, you want something that will ensure that you don't fall into the traps that you and other enemies have set for you. Then read with me, if you would, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning with verse 9, and we're going to see God's triple A life insurance policy. He says in verse 9, he says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Verse 10 says, If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. There's that isolation again. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can we one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Now, if you've ever been to a wedding ceremony, now this week I, was, I, I, was, I met somebody who was in their 20s who's never been to a wedding ceremony. That's amazing to me. But they, hey, that's the times we live in. But if you've ever been to a wedding ceremony, there's a good chance that you've heard those verses applied to marriage and God. And I get that. That's cool. But this, was not, this passage was not written about marriage. This passage was, was practical advice for the Debbie Kobels of this world. How can she not fall into the pits of life? How can we not fall into the traps of the evil one? And growing up, my daddy always told me that AAA insurance was the best insurance around. And today, our heavenly daddy is saying to us, hey, here's, here's three A's that you need to get. There's three things that you need to do. There's three things that need, we need to have in our life if we don't want to fail epically. You're saying, Randy, what's the first A? Well, the first thing we need is this. We need an accountability partner. We need an accountability partner. It is spelled for you on the screen. Do not ask me to spell it for you. We need an accountability partner. You're saying, Randy, what is that? Let me give you the definition. An accountability partner is this. You ready? It is someone we give permission to to have influence over our life choices. An accountability partner is someone we give permission to have influence over our life choices. The key words there are permission, influences, and choices. So for those of you who don't want to write that whole sentence down, permission, influence, and choices. Basically what it is, is, is when we have an accountability partner, we are giving them permission to have a say over what we do. We're giving them permission to have an opinion over the things that we do. We're we're giving them permission to have influence over our life choices. And we see them in Ecclesiastes 4.9. He says, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. And that is exactly what an accountability partner is. When I am somebody's accountability partner, then I am choosing to do everything I can to help them to be a success. I am doing everything in my power to help them to succeed. All the advice I give them, all the things that I say to them, it is, it is around one central goal. I want them to be a successful husband. I want them to be a successful father. I want them to be a successful brother, sister, friend, neighbor, co-worker. I want their success. And that's what an accountability partner's job is to do. I think of Jason in my life. When I first met Jason, never in a thousand years did I think that God was going to use Jason. He's like 12 years old. To, I, I never thought that he would, God would use him as an accountability partner in my life. But he has been that for me in the last five years. I have given him permission to have an opinion over the decisions that I make. And I'll be honest with you, the times that I don't let him have an opinion, the times that I do not give him permission are the choices and the decisions that I have regretted. God has used Jason to make me better. Now that leads us to a fact I hope you always remember. Some of you are saying, yeah, I want one of these accountability partners. I want one of them. Well, here's the fact, and the fact is this. Accountability is not, underline the word not, accountability is not fun. Think about how it's often described in Proverbs 27, 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so people can improve each other. Now, again, if you've never seen iron sharpening iron, the sharpening process is very uncomfortable. The the sharpening process is most likely painful. In fact, some of you 
need to listen to me right now because you're going around telling people that such and such and so and so is your accountability partner and all y'all do is get together and giggle and laugh and cut up. That's not accountability. If you, I'll tell you who you use your accountability partner in your life. When you walk away from a conversation in their life and you're going, ow, e, that's smarts. I'm thankful for it, but I didn't enjoy it. You know, I, I, I laugh all the time because, you know, Paul's one of the people that pursued me and asked me to be one of his accountability partner. And, and everybody acts like Paul's just, he's so lucky to have me as this accountability partner. Y'all don't know our conversations. He walks away all the time going, why in the world did I volunteer for this? Because I hurt his feelings all the time. And see, I personally believe, you can write this down if you don't want to. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I personally believe your accountability partner is the one who calls BS on you. They look at what you're doing and everybody else around you is telling you, go for it. You're awesome. You're great. You're wonderful. Your accountability partner is the only one that loves you enough to say you're stupid. Stop doing that. That's what accountability looks like. You're saying, Randy, why in the world would I want somebody to call me stupid? Why in the world would I volunteer for somebody to meet with me on a consistent basis and call me dumb? Why? Because we need someone in our life to reflect God to us. Notice what Hebrews 4.13 says. It says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. We're basically asking with an accountability partner to reflect God. Because the Bible says whether we want to admit it or not, Barney's going to stand before a holy God one day, and he is going to be held accountable for how he is as a husband. He's going to be held accountable for how he is as a father and a brother and a friend and a church person. And we need somebody to deal with us now so that when we stand before God, it won't hurt so bad. So first A in the AAA life insurance policy that Randy Hand's offering you today is the accountability partner, but there's a second A that we need. Ready? We need an authority figure. We need an authority figure. We need an authority figure. You're saying, Randy, what in the world is that? I'm going to go slow here because this is a little longer than the other one, but write this down. Authority figure is someone God, underline that word God, someone God has placed in our lives to represent him and to share his word to us. An authority figure is someone God has placed in our lives to represent him and to share his word to us. Now, guess what? An authority, you might want to write this down if you think about it, if you don't have to. But an authority figure is not a friend. They're not a buddy. They're not a pal. They're not even an accountability partner. An authority figure is somebody that stands up in your life and says, thus saith the Lord. Could be a parent. I know that flies in the face of you parents today. All you want to be is a friend and a pal to your children. Your children need an authority figure. They need somebody to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. Honor your father and mother. Thus saith the Lord. Love your neighbors. Thus saith the Lord. Obey the Ten Commandments. Thus saith... We, we need authority figures more than we need friends. An authority figure is someone God has placed in our life to represent him and to share his word to us. We see in Ecclesiastes 4.10, it says, If one person falls, then the other can reach out and help. Now here's the thing. An accountability partner might not help you. Because why? Because God's not going to speak to them. When he talks about reaching out and help, he's saying that God will give your, ooh, this is good. God will give your authority figure a supernatural word for you. That's why I don't understand why some of you refuse to talk to your, the authority figures in your life. Because it is only those people that God's, you'll, you'll, you're like Rehoboam, you'll go out and talk to your friends. You're like Rehoboam, you'll go out and talk to your buddies. But you will not talk to the authority figures. And it's only the authority figures that God will specifically speak a word to them about your situation. 
I have been amazed in my life how people who humble themselves and come to me and say, Hey, Randy, you are my pastor. Here's my, here's my question. Will you tell me what God says about this? And all of a sudden, the word of the Lord will come upon me, and wow. And I'm going, I didn't say that. I'm just a donkey that God used. You see, that authority figure is a supernatural person used by God to reach out and help us through life. You're saying, Randy, I don't know if I can do this. Randy, I've tried this before. I, I just, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. Well, notice the truth, and the truth is key. Here's, I hope, if you wrote, don't write anything else down today, write this down. Trust is the key to submitting to authority. Trust is the key to submitting to authority. If you don't trust your authority figure, whether it be your parent, whether it be your pastor, whether it be your boss, whether it be whatever, your, your, your mayor, your town council, if you don't trust your authority figure, then you will not submit to them. You will not do what they say. We see that in Hebrews 13, 17. It says, have confidence. That's another word for trust. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. What's he saying there? He's saying that authority figure's job is to keep watch over you, to watch out for you. For example, you don't know how many times, some of you wonder why I have these little private conversations with you. Because I will be sleeping dead asleep and God will wake me up and say, so-and-so is getting ready to do something stupid. You need to go speak truth to them. And I don't want to go. I don't want to. You, you do understand, y'all are messy. And I do my best to keep my life clean. And yet God tells me all the time that as your authority figure, I have got to get up and go to you and enter into that mess you call a marriage, enter into that mess called your children and your parenting style, enter into that mess called your finances, and speak the word of God over you. Why? Because I have to give an account one day. As your authority figure, God is my accountability partner. Does that make sense? By the way, again, remember the truth. Trust is the key to submitting to authority. Now, you might want to write this down. We don't trust the person. We don't trust the person. And if you're wondering where I get that, I think of Jesus in John 2, 24. In, G in John 2, 24, Jesus said about the people all around him, humans in general, that he knew what was in their heart and he did not trust them. So I don't trust my, the person that is my authority figure. I trust the God that placed them in my life. You see, Debbie does not have to trust me. She has to trust the God that has placed me over her as an authority figure in her life. You see, most of the commands, you do your research. Most of the commands that say submit, thou shalt submit. Most of the commands to submit is followed by something that says to the Lord. Wives, submit to your authority figure, which is your husband, as unto the Lord. Children, obey your parents unto the Lord. Why? Children should not trust their parents. Their parents are idiots. But the kids can trust the God who put them over, their parents over them. Make sense? So when you say, Randy, I have a hard time trusting my husband. I have a hard time trusting my father. I have a hard time trusting my authority figure. You're basically saying, I have a hard time trusting the Lord. Because think about it. He could have put you anywhere at any time. And he chose to put you where you are right now. You're saying, well, Randy, I don't like it. Yeah. When God wakes up every morning. He says, you know what? I just want to do what they like. Is that the God of the Bible that you've read about? It's not the God I read about. In fact, my likes are really not top 412 of his concerns. So you're saying, well, Randy, who do I choose? If, I, if I'm going to submit to authority, if, if you've got young ladies here, <clears throat> Jessica, if you have young ladies here that are thinking about maybe having a husband one day, like when she's 60, if you've got young ladies here that, that are thinking about getting a husband, you know, I, I mean, I, you got one question, because that husband's your authority. Whether you want to admit it or not, as Jason says, we are not of this world. Our standards are not the world's standards. Our standards are God's standards. 
And God has said the husband is the authority over the wife. And so if I'm looking for a husband today, thank God I'm not. (laughs) Who am I looking for? I'm looking for somebody like Jesus. I'm looking for the guy that is so much like Jesus. Why? Because look at what 1 Timothy 6.15 says. It says, Jesus is the only almighty God, the king of kings, all kings, and the Lord of all lords. What's he saying? That Jesus is the authority figure over the whole universe. And if we're going to get an authority figure in our life, let's find somebody like him. And so the first A was what? We need an accountability partner. We need someone to call BS in our life. The second A was what? We need an authority figure. We need somebody that, that, that... will rule over us and lead us and, and, and help us to be who God wants us to be, to represent God to him and share his word. But there's a third thing. Now, I'll be honest with you. This sermon's been percolating in me for weeks, but God only added this part at the end because he knows this is where I struggle. The third A, if we want to have AAA life insurance, the third A is we need an admirer. We need an admirer. We need someone. You're saying, Randy, what else an admirer? The definition of admirer is this. Ready? An admirer is someone who likes and is devoted to us, a fan of who we are and can be. An admirer is someone who likes and is devoted to us, a fan of who we are and can be. You see, an admirer is somebody that looks at us and sees things in us that we don't even see in ourselves. An admirer is someone who, who sees us and is so thankful and amazed that they get to be a part of our life. That's what an admirer is. And we see them in Ecclesiastes 4.11. It says, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. An admirer is what? It's someone we let close to us who, who loves us warts and all. Now, I'll be honest with you. This has been real hard for me. This is, this is a hard one for me. If there's anything that I'm going to struggle with, because I've, I've had accountability for 30 years. I've had authority for 30 years. But I have a hard time letting people close to me that admire me. I've always been suspicious of them. I've always thought that something must be wrong with them for them to like me. You see, I spent 18 years with a woman that made it her point every day of my life to tell me what a sorry sack of crap I was. And this was the one that stood before God and witnesses and said, hey, love, honor, and cherish. And for 18 years, I felt like I was under psychological warfare, where for 18 years, I was beat down. And so I am, especially, then I... Crazy me decided to go to work for the church. And you know, there's whole, source, there's whole groups of people in the church that feel it's their God-given duty to put the pastor down. To remind the pastor over and over again of his failings and his failures. And so I spent decades just being told what a worthless pile of crap I was. And I was told that that was love. So this was hard. But God reminded me this week of this. Please remember this. Having an admirer is not an option for people of faith. Having an admirer is not an option for people of faith. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 commands, it says, Encourage each other and build each other up. Guys, that's a foundation. That's one of the foundational principles of this thing called Christianity, is we are to have a cheerleader in our life that builds us up. I don't know if you know this or not, because many of you grew up in churches like me, but did you know that, that, that having a cheerleader, having some, an admirer, is one of the reasons why we have the 1030 service on Sundays? Hebrews 10, 25 tells us this. He says, let us not neglect our meeting together. He's talking about right now. He's saying, hey, go to church. Why? He's, Why do you need to go to church? He tells you. Why go to church? But w- Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. Do me a favor. If you, right out beside Hebrews 10, 25, you don't have to write the whole verse down, 
but write out the word cheerleader. He's saying that word encourage literally means cheerleader. It's where we get our modern day equivalent of a cheerleader. That he's saying that when you come to church, now it might not be during the sermon, but somehow, sometime during church, you should be encouraged, you should be cheerleaded, you should, be, you should walk away from here saying, I can do this for another week. And if you don't, one or two things is happening. Either you're refusing the encouragement or we're failing. And I'm okay to say that we fail sometimes. But it is the reason why we get together. I, I think of the, the guy Barnabas in Acts. Notice what the verse said, Acts 4.36. There was a Christian named Joseph. So his name was really Joseph. We've called him Barnabas all his life, all our lives. But his name was Joseph. He said there was a Christian named Jer- Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So he started off as a Joe. But then Jesus got a hold of him. And his name changed to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Means, think about it. Think about what an awesome dude this guy was. That he goes his whole life, his name's Joseph, but he be- Jesus gets a hold of him. And he becomes such an encourager that the elders, the leaders of the church changed his name to Barnabas. And then for the rest of the book, he's called Barnabas. By the way, he didn't wake up like that. He made the choice. He understood 1 Thessalonians 5.11 was a command that we are to encourage each other and, and build each other up. And so Joseph decided that, hey, I'm going to make that a reality. And he did it so well that his name changed to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Now, here's the thing. You do realize it's okay for you to do that. Can I give you permission because some of you husbands, some of you wives, somehow, some way, you think it's evil to be an encouragement to your spouse, to be that person, that admirer to your spouse. You think it's your God-given right to put them down all the time. Can I give you permission today to brag on your family? Can I give you permission today to be that one person at work? that finds something good to say about others? Can I give you permission today to to be so awesome that the people in your life change your name to Barnabas? It's okay. It's okay to be an encouragement to others, especially your loved ones. Because when I walk in most of your homes, I feel like the 11th commandment on your wall is, well, let's put each other down. Let's make sure we humble each other, which is a nice way of saying let's humiliate each other. And some of you sit there and you say, Randy, why don't I have any friends? Can I tell you something? When I chose to be this guy, outside of the pulpit, obviously, when I chose to be this guy, man, I got to turn people away. Because why? Because we all long to have a Barnabas in our life. We all long to have that someone that will encourage us in the things that we do now i know what you're thinking some of you i love it when you do this you you're quoting me you're going to use me to disagree with me you're right now arguing in your head with what i'm saying here you're using my words to argue with what i'm saying now and you're saying randy people are sinners right people are idiots Right? Any people stink. They are, you've said it, they are flawed from birth. You're the one that says we're all born sinners. We're all worthless piles of crap that deserve death and hell. You say that all the time, Randy. So how in the world can an honest person be an admirer of a flawed human? How do we do that? How can we be an honest spouse, an honest parent, an honest child of a flawed person and still be their admirer. The key is Romans 14, 19. Romans 14, 19 says this, let us concentrate on the things which make for harmony and on the growth of our relationship together. Let's concentrate. What's he saying there? 
You see, a true admirer, a biblical admirer, doesn't ignore the flaws of the other. A biblical admirer does not pretend that their flaws are not there. A biblical admiring husband, a biblical admiring wife, a biblical admiring parent or child, they do not ignore or pretend. What they do, though, is they choose to concentrate on the good part of the other, even if all the other one has is potential. I get it. There are people in your life that have, because of their choices, they are so worthless and pathetic. But a true admirer says, you know what? They're still made in the image of God. They've got two arms, two legs, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. They are made in Jesus' image. And so therefore, I'm going to concentrate on their potential, even though there's nothing in their life worthwhile concentrating on now. God made me cry this morning. And I almost cried while I was reading that verse. Because while I was reading that verse this morning, God reminded of me of when Jennifer and I got married. You see, when we got married, right now I weighed 155 this week, if that tells you anything. Okay? When we got married, I was a little bit taller than I am now because I'm firmly convinced I've shrunk. Because 10 years has been a long 10 years. Y'all's burdens have been heavy to bear. Okay? But when we got married, I was 185 pounds. And I still remember the first couple years we were married. Because you see, I'm just as honest about myself as I am about you. Okay? And so, I don't know, we had a demon uh, house builder. Demonic man. Had to be. Here's why. Because he made the mirror in the bathroom go all the way over on the opposite wall to when I got out of the shower. So when I pulled back the curtain, right, first thing I saw was me in all my glory. And so I knew what I looked like at 185 pounds, 5 foot 6. And yet I'd walk out of that shower... And my wife would be pinching me and tickling me and rubbing me and trying to get me to go be a newlywed with her. You're welcome, Jessica. (laughs) And I would literally be sitting there thinking why she was doing that. What the heck fire does she see? Because I just saw me in the mirror. But what did she do? She saw my potential even when it wasn't a reality. She saw the the me that was on the inside that was covered by 40 pounds of fat. And she was attracted and she admired and she had loved that guy. Not the one that she had to lay beside every night. That's an admirer, guys. And that's what God has called us to. To do for others. Some of you are thinking right now, you're saying, Randy, I don't even think that even God likes me. How could somebody else like me when the God who created me, I don't even think he likes me? Well, there's a reason why God put those little books in the Bible. And there's one particular book that I want you to read with me right now Zephaniah. Probably never read it in your life. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says this says, the Lord your God is with you. The Mighty One will save you. He will rejoice over you. You will rest in His love. He will sing and be joyful about you. I don't know about you, but that last part there sounds like an admirer, doesn't it? So how do we get that? How do we get, because we know the Bible, the same Bible also says that if we're not a Christian, that God is our enemy. He's not our admirer. So how do we go from being an enemy of God to where he's our admirer? Well, look at that first phrase. He is the mighty one who will save you. Is God your admirer? Or is he your enemy? Why don't we talk to the Lord about that right now? Bow your heads, close your eyes, every head bowed, every eye closed.
You say, Randy, what's the big deal about getting saved? That just sounds like somebody wanting to pad his stats. Well, let me tell you what happens when we get saved. The Bible says in Galatians 3.27 that when we get saved, God stops seeing the, the wicked, evil part of us and he sees his precious, beloved son, Jesus. The verse literally describes it as us putting on new clothes. That we wear Jesus like clothes. So that the only way that, and you do understand this, the only way God can become your admirer and stop being your enemy is if you are saved into Jesus. So that then... All he sees is Jesus. He doesn't see you and your sin. So I wonder, have you been saved today? Not saved like you may have thought the hundreds of times some of you have been in this church. I'm talking about saved like that. Has there ever been a time when you ask God to kill that nasty, sinful part of you and then clothe you with Jesus? So that, G, so that God the Father will love you like he loves the Son. Has that happened to you? Because if it hasn't, it can. It can. Let me encourage you. Let me be your Barnabas and say, I know it's rough to have the bad part of you to die. I get it. It was hard for me too. But can I promise you this? That it's worth it on the other side. I am on the other side of this equation saying, please come follow. Follow me as I follow Jesus. And that, yeah, it's rough to die. I get it. Nobody wants to die. But not even spiritually. But if you will allow God to kill the old you and give you a new heart, he will go from being your enemy to being your biggest fan. And I don't know about you, but I need all the fans I can get in my life. So you're saying, Randy, how do I do that? Well, in just a few seconds, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer for me, with me, not to me, but if you'll pray this prayer with me, then God will kill that old you. He'll clothe you with Jesus. And he'll go from being your enemy to being your friend. You're saying, Randy, do I need to pray it out loud? You don't have to. I would love for you to. Because sometimes it's so easy to forget. But I am going to ask those who have called upon the name of the Lord, who are saved, to pray this prayer with me as a renewal of their vow to God, but also as an encouragement. Be a Barnabas, Christian. Be a Barnabas to those who are praying this for the first time today. Would you pray with me right now? Would you just pray, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I pray. Oh, let me pray for you right now. Dear God, I know that a lot of things are going along in our minds right now. We've got so many thoughts and ideas. And Lord, I just pray for the one who just prayed that prayer with me for the first time. That they, they let the old them die. and they, were, they put on Jesus like clothes. Lord, first of all, help them to know that it's forever. That once you adopt them, you never let them go. And that, Lord, help them to know that that's why they can pray. That in the past, their prayers have bounced off the ceiling, but now they can pray because when when we pray now, Lord God, Father, you hear Jesus. Teach them that, Lord God. And, Lord, give them a supernatural desire to read your Bible. If I need to buy them one, so be it. Lord, be with us now. Most of us are Christians, or think we are. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with this service, be with this invitation. Help us to do business with you in a real and a powerful way. It's in your name I ask. Amen.